Hello, my name is Catherine Greger and I'm a translator from Italian and French and it is my pleasure today to be in conversation with Deborah Dawkin, who has translated the second installment of this trilogy Balash meeting. The second is called The Reindeer Hunters, which is a wonderful book um, published by McElhose Press and is a sequel to another success, which is The Bell in the Lake. So my first question is, um, Deborah, uh, both The Bell in the Lake and The Reindeer Hunters are obviously translations from Norwegian, but the characters speak in, in a different way depending on their region of origin, but also their social status. In other words, they don't just speak standard Norwegian. Can you tell us a little about how you handled that? Because I think you handled it beautifully. Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's a bit of one of those translator nightmares, really, when you get something that has dialect in it, you kind of tend, to, we tend to try and avoid it because what one doesn't want to do with a dialect is to transport the story to some locale in the UK um, so that suddenly they're imagining everything taking place in Scotland. You want to maintain, you don't want to break the illusion that actually they're being transported to Norway. So having made the decision that in a sense for the richness of the text and for the, for the sense of um, the hierarchies within the story and um, a sense of the, the, the rural personalities um, that he describes so beautifully, I felt that I, I had to somehow crack this. So what I did was actually research um, some dialects originally collect, collected in, at the end of the 19th century. Um, um, and I honed in on one, I don't want to give it away because I don't want to, I don't want to kind of make people start thinking. So I honed in on one particular dialect and simplified it so that I, so that actually a lot of the a lot of the 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 specific choices of words or um, actually come in a lot of dialects, right? So it was kind of in a way a neutral dialect, but it had this kind of background in this one specific very small area of the UK, where from which and it took time. I would steal very um, very rich words that mm. you or I wouldn't normally recognize, but within context made, you realize as a reader, within the context, you understand what's being said. Um, um, that was important to do that. It was uh, one of the reasons I couldn't really avoid the whole dialect thing was that actually now and again, Mitting has his characters, Astrid in particular, saying things that saying things that the other character, the pastor, doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so if I didn't have something believable as a match for that, then I would lose those parts of the text, which seemed very important to me. Because mm -hmm. again, it was, it was very much, those passages were very much kind of, she would be playing with the fact he couldn't understand what she said and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, well, so I had to face up to it, I had to tackle it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did in a way, and it's absolutely, I, th I thought it was, um, I think it works really well. I think you really get the the, te the different textures of the way people speak. And I think that's, the, the, I think that's part of the charms of the book. It um, came to me as a great relief that people actually enjoyed it, because I was biting my oh, nails. I loved it. I loved the first one. I... I sat up half the night to finish reading. I could put it down. I'm engrossed in this one. If it's a, it's 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 a page turner, but at the same time, it it has it has a depth to it. It has a um, all all this kind of it's really old religion versus new religion. It's yeah. people. There's something um, magical about it. It's it's an extraordinary book. I'm looking forward to the third one. Um, can I just ask, um, do you have a favorite character in the book? In the, in the um, reindeer hunters? In, in a way, in a way, no, because they are all so lovable. 
Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, you care so deeply about them. I mean, I was I I starting in the Bell and the Lake in a way, and I think that's kind of you grow to love these characters, and they sort of remain even those that. I shouldn't give it away, should I? Even even some of those that don't feature in the <laughs> second volume um, are in the shadows. Um, mm -hmm. um, I I don't know. Um, I think one of Mitten's qualities is that he creates characters that are all deeply faulty, deeply faulty. Mm -hmm. You know, and because of, and um, so there's never anyone who kind of in a way you're totally on their side because you can see that both are struggling the best mm. they can. Um, and if there's, a lack of, if there's a lack of communication, it's because they, they, they both have their own struggles. Mm. And I think that's, please excuse me. It's fine. I think that's, what, I think that's a wonderful quality in the writing. Mm. Yeah. Do you have a lot, did you have, did you have a lot of interaction with the author during the translation process? I had, a huge amount of interaction with um, Lash in um, on the, when we were working when I was working on the first book, but bit, bit by bit, bit in a sense, we built so much trust um, in each other, mm -hmm. and so that there was less need um, for book number two in a way. It kind of mm. Lash was very busy and um, I was very busy, and yet at the same time, it it. Obviously, we still communicated it, but we didn't actually need to say so much mm. because it was as if we'd covered the ground um, about what priorities are. Because I think that's one of the reasons, because I love working quite closely with authors. And I think one of the reasons that I think it's enriching to the work is not just because you're kind of able to, in that process, you might, you know, tackle a few translation problems. But what you learn in that process is, what that author's priorities are, mm. um, how how they in a way feel about their own characters, and how and what the essence of their story is, what it is they want to tell. Mm. I I'd agree kind of with that. Under, so you have a a, a sense of the driving force behind the text, um, which which I which I think enriches it. And it also gives you a wonderful testing ground as a translator. If you're wanting to take, if you feel that risks need to be taken or, you know, you can test those out with the author, how, how that author feels about you taking a certain risk or going in a certain direction or mm. whatever with it. If you feel that somehow or other you need to be here and there a little bit creative or whatever. And then through that, you get a good working relationship. Yeah. I think that's that's, uh, it's wonderful. I and and so what you mean. I like um, wherever possible to find out how the author ticks. Um, yeah. Again, exactly. as you said, the driving exactly. force behind the characters, behind yeah. the prose, behind the book, because it, it, it's it's a, you, you, you can capture the the tone, you capture the 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 energy yeah. behind it. I I think it's yeah. it's it's wonderful when one can has can have that. It is. Um, now, obviously, as a translator myself, something. Um, I'm interested in is um, that little thing called copy editing. Um, and I mean, how, I mean, sometimes we get copy editors who know the source language. I've and, never and had that. You've never had that. No. Um, and sometimes you don't. Norwegian is a more rare language in that sense. So, so how does that work that. when you, in, in a sense, in your case, how, how did this work? with the copy edit? I mean, did you have to um, sometimes tell the copy editor that, um, well, the suggestion was great, but it wasn't exactly what the author said? Or... Oh, I'm always doing that. I'm telling <laughs> you, yeah. No, I think as it, when I'm, I, I, I generally now, I'll get the copy edit. So, you, you know, you get your copy back, obviously. Um, and then I will talk with copy editors generally um thank goodness and good copy editors thank god for them that's all i can say mm. uh, yeah so about 40 percent i probably accept about 40 between four depending on the book between 40 and 50 percent of the edits just straight 
And then there'll be another 40% or 50% where I actually, what I'll do is find a third way. Mm. And then there'll be a 10% I might dig my heels in about. Mm. That's totally average. But, um, and I, what I usually find is that when, a, when an editor um, puts a suggestion board or whatever, or correct, inverted commas, correct something, is that it is always a flag. It's mm. always a flag, usually mm. a flag, to there being a problem. Mm which I might have to solve in another way. And, you know, good editors as well, very often is I find that when you talk to them, they'll have, you know, you can say, well, the problem's this. The author's saying this. Mm. And uh, sometimes they can come up with another suggestion, which is great. So I don't know, I'm, yeah, generally, generally, I thank God for good cause good kept copy editors are worth their weight in gold i'll say that absolutely good ones absolutely. absolutely um now your background is acting how did mm -hmm. you come into translation oh felicity says what did, what did you say um happy accident okay and how yeah. do you think that um contributes to um, is there anything about acting that you feel is useful or anything you, you experience in the theater or in filming? First of all, I think, first of all, maybe go back a little bit is that I said happy accent, which in a way I've always been without, without um, having any um, ambitions towards being a, a translator. Mm. I've always throughout my life translated. I can remember even as a, even as a teenager being mad enough to spend my lunch times in the school library doing my own translations of Moliere. No idea why, no idea. It was like a compulsion. Um, and then coming, you know, going further, when I had my own theatre company, I did translations for that. I translated a lot of, um, there's a poetess called um, Inga Hargroup. And I did a one woman show based on her. So for, for me, translation was always, was always there in a way. And also aware when you're working with translations of the difference between the original and, and what you're working with. Um, so it was always, translation was always there. And I think also because of that, um, I never had a precious attitude towards translation, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. Translation is a means of communication, of communicating one beautiful thing or a, a beautiful work of art or whatever to other people who wouldn't otherwise have access to it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, yeah, so, so that's one thing. And then how it influences my work is that I think very much, you know, actors very much think in terms of voices, one, voices. So not only the characters within the text, but the narrator itself, for me, character has a voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking style, I'm talking voice, which is a slight, there's a slight difference. Um, but I also think as well, as an actor, you're, you're kind of, um, you're very alert to what the story is you're telling. Mm -hmm. um, and what my motive, what, you know, you're taught in the sense to be hyper aware of motivation, you know, because an actor who doesn't know what his motivation for being on stage is, is lost, yeah? So in a way that kind of drives my work as, as, uh, with text, kind of, I'm always aware, always alert to what I feel is the motivation of the author, mm. in a sense. And what 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 is intended by a certain passage, which then reflects in the voice, mm. you know, rather than it just being so. For me, it's a very living thing. It's a very living organism. The text, rather than it just being words on a page that need to be translated accurately. Why is the author saying it in this particular way at this particular moment, or why is that particular word being used? You know, not which sometimes sometimes means that you're um, 
you're you're more aware of the associations that go with the word mm. and necessarily just the word itself I, that makes perfect Does that sense. Does that make sense? Abs absolutely, totally, totally. I mean, um, as, as somebody with a non-acting but theatrical background myself, I, I, I totally, really, totally get that. Um, now, uh, as a last question, something I'd like to ask you. We had a chat about this earlier on, and I was fascinated by what something you said, and I'd really like um, other people to hear this because. With translators, my, my, my seniors, my betters always tell, tell me about rhythm. And I know what they mean and they're right, but it's never quite sat well with me. And you were able to put your finger on why it doesn't in my case. And, and you said to me when we first started talking, it's not about rhythm. Please, could you tell me this again? <laughs> oh, problem is repeating oneself. It's always difficult. Um, <laughs> um, I you cannot, and I say again, cannot imitate the rhythm of one language in another. It's not for nothing that um, iambic pentameters or whatever, that, you know, we, we each language has its own choices of rhythmic structure in poetry, etc. Where we put the emphasis on words will differ from one language to another. But what we can do is be very aware of tempo and how or how and or how percussive, for example, something is. Um, that's slightly different to rhythm. It's not the exact rhythm. It's the level of percussiveness as opposed to lyrical, the level, the level of consonant as opposed to, to vowels, for example. Yeah. The other thing is that, so, I mean, one example I gave you, can I use the rude one? <laughs> I, not. Think, I think so. Am I allowed uh, to? Or will be edited, in case will be edited out. Okay, anyway. So if you think about something like, fuck off. It's short, it's punch, it punches, yeah. They say, get the fuck out of here, does not do the same thing. You might be, you might actually be confronted with with two different. Uh, you might be confronted with um, a sentence which you'd be tempted to. You you don't think about how it's going to be said, how it rings spoken wise, and I think it's very so. It's very important all the way with text to be looking at how it runs. Mm. Does is the author you know, punching out, is he gliding? Is he light? Or is, are these deep tones? And all that's to do with pace and tempo and texture, mm. not rhythm, because you can't translate rhythm. Mm. But you can be aware of tempo and pace. The way you phrase it is a revelation to me because it, it, it really resonates. Thank you. Oh, Good. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Um, just to finish off, um, can you, would you like to tell us, tell me what any future project about what you're working on now or what you're about to work uh, well, on? At the moment I'm working on um, some poetry, which is interesting. Um, it's um, by Nils Christian Morepster, um, who's an award-winning poet in Norway. Um, very interesting because the they're very small, but each poet, I'll show you the book. I love it. I love that aesthetically, it's like a block, it's like a brick. <laughs> and you open it up and each three line poem mm. has one page devoted to it. Um, and of course they all link up. And uh, a lot of it's very depressing, but uh, very beautifully so. Um, <laughs> um, and I love it because it, it has a certain challenge as well because it's, poems are meant to fit into a certain space which gives another challenge again um, and what what I love about it is that um, the thoughts seem to be quite random mm -hmm. in the way he's designed it mm -hmm. um, po poetry has a wonderful sense of that um, you've got unlike um, you've got uh, dissimilar ideas put into one but 
when you put it into this very strict framework, it's, it's like putting something neatly into a box. And it's called Bundekammer, which means curiosity cabinet, which is beautiful because that's like all these yes. random different sparkly or odd objects contained neatly Deborah in Dorkin, a cabinet. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you. you for, again, um, I really recommend this, The Deer Hunters by Lars Schmitting. And if those who have, obviously, the, begin the first book is The Bell on the Lake, which I wholeheartedly recommend. And then this one and the third one. Thank you ever so much again. Pleasure. Pleasure.